All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual college day. Um, at this time, as you are entering the room, you will notice your microphone and camera are off. Um, you are muted and our panelists cannot hear or see you. However, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask our panelists any questions throughout this entire session and they would be happy to help. Um, furthermore, we do have more sessions like this happening and they can be found on our website. And lastly, this recording will be available on our site next week. So without further ado, I'll allow our presenters to begin. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Caitlin Latta. I'm one of the Associate Directors of Admission at Denison University. Um, today, my two colleagues who I will let um, introduce themselves shortly and I are going to be talking about admission and athletics at liberal arts colleges and universities. So talking a little bit about um, the culture of athletics on our institutions and the differences between division one, two, and three, as well as some of the additional pieces that you might want to consider, especially if you're considering playing um, a varsity sport at an institution. So Jake, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, my name is Jacob Brown. I'm the director of admission at Eckerd College, located in St. Petersburg, Florida. Yes, I do use all of those tabs. So I'm going to see if I can somehow make it that you don't. Oops. No, I can't. So you're just going to have to deal with all my tabs. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jenna Sherino. I serve as the Associate Director of Admissions for St. Mary's College of California, uh, which is in the heart of the East Bay in um, the Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we are a Division I NCAA athletic school, so I'm excited to share more about our athletic opportunities as well as the greater landscape of opportunities for student athletes, specifically at liberal arts colleges. Great. Okay. So just to tell you a little bit, um, we're going to tell you a little bit about our institutions quickly, specifically. Um, and as I said, I work for Denison University, which is a small liberal arts college in Granville, Ohio. These are kind of the pertinent facts and figures about Denison, but we are located in Granville, which is a small Midwestern town about 45 minutes from Columbus, Ohio. So our students really enjoy a great mix of small town with access to a big city. We have about 2,300 students and we are division three. So Jake, do you wanna to go to the next slide, please? Um, like the other institutions represented here, we have a number of different varsity sports offered. You can see the listing here um, of our women and men's sports, pretty similar, but some differences. Some of our most successful sports recently are men swimming and diving and lacrosse and field hockey tend to do quite well. We also have clubs and intramurals offers and we're going to talk a little bit about those um, as we kind of go through this presentation, but we are a small but mighty athletics program um, and athletics about a third of our student body is involved as a varsity athlete at Denison. So that's a little bit about Denison. I'll pass it on to Jake. Great, thanks so much. So as I mentioned, um, Eckerd College is located in St. Petersburg, Florida. St. Petersburg is on the Gulf Coast. Um, so we're right outside of Tampa, part of the Tampa Bay metropolitan region. Um, St. Pete itself is a peninsula, I like to say, on a much larger peninsula of Florida. And so we're, um, we sit at the lower tip of that peninsula. So about a mile and a half of campus is waterfront. Yes, we have our own beach. Um, athletic facilities, everything right there on our 188 acre campus. Um, we're also the pet friendliest campus in the United States. So if you wanna play sports and bring your pup so that your pup can watch you play sports, you could totally do that. Um, yes, you'll see the Colleges That Change Lives um, logo right there. We're part of this event. So obviously Eckerd's a part of the Colleges That Change Lives. Our geographic reach is also something that I think it's quite extraordinary for such a small school of 1,970 students. 80% of our students, 80% come from outside of the state of Florida. And on average, our students are traveling a thousand miles from home um, to come to campus. Whereas typically the national average of distance traveled from your home to your college is about 200 to 250 miles. 
Um, so you'll see our geographic reach there. We're also one of 10% of colleges and universities that have a Phi Beta Kappa chapter. It's uh, America's oldest and most prestigious honors um, society. In terms of athletics, we're division two. Um, really interesting fun fact, in the state of Florida, there are only division one or division two institutions. We do not have division three institutions within our state. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means as part of different divisions. Um, these are our different intercollegiate um, sports. So baseball, certainly really, really big um, in this area and in Florida, basketball, um, soccer, sailing, um, and then for the women, some similar ones, uh, including volleyball and beach volleyball, which at one point was called sand volleyball, but I'm really glad that it's now beach volleyball, even though not too many schools have it on their beach like we do. One of the other interesting things is outside of the NCAA, but we have a really, really competitive nationally ranked sailing program. So when we're talking about recruitment, if you are interested in sailing, um, that recruitment happens outside of the NCAA. There's no athletic scholarships, but it certainly is one of our um, varsity intercollegiate sports. And I'll pass it along to Jenna. All right, and you all likely that are joining us today, you probably are aware that each and every one of us, so Dennis and Eckerd and St. Mary's, we are all affiliated and renowned in the colleges that change lives, uh, which I wanna introduce just how monumental this identity is for each and every single one of our colleges in that we, exist in the colleges that change lives because we are dedicated to a student-centered college search process where we really focus on the importance of fit. So for you all joining us that are maybe considering playing a sport in college, um, you know, we're very aware that you want to make the college experience so many different things. So for students that want to get involved in sports, but also leadership and study abroad, um, you know, schools within the colleges that change lives really focus on offering those really unique experiences that establish a much more transformational approach to learning. Um, and St. Mary's is actually the only Catholic, only California and only division one school that is renowned in the colleges that change lives. So just fun fact right off the bat, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're located in the heart of the San Francisco Bay Area in a town called Moraga, um, big college town, really residential area, but about 35 minutes east of San Francisco, and then 15 minutes from Oakland and 15 minutes from Berkeley. Um, so we're in a really great place, I think, for students in general to really have a campus centered community, but also to experience the incredible diversity and all the incredible things that there are to do um, in the area that we live in. Um, like many schools in the Colleges That Change Lives, we're a smaller school. We serve about 2,600 undergraduate students, and most students live on campus all four years. Um, we're extremely residential. About 75% of our students do live on campus from their freshman to their senior year, and we do require our first-year students um, in normal years to live on campus. This was the only year that we did not due to the pandemic. Um, academically, all of us in the, uh, in the Colleges That Change Lives are liberal arts and sciences schools. Um, the same is very true at St. Mary's. Um, distinctly, we don't have any impacted or capped majors. So for any families that are joining us from California that are applying to CSU colleges, potentially um, St. Mary's does not limit the number of students that are accepted into a particular program. Um, all of our programs span across 43 different academic majors and our average class size is about 19 students. Um, and notably, the reason why we're here today is to discuss our division one um, identity in the NCAA we have 16 Division I men's and women's sports um, that compete at the varsity D1 level, and we have over 23 club and intramural sporting opportunities as well. Um, so here you can see for both our D1 men and D1 women, um, the athletics programs that we do offer. Um, in the next slide, in a second, I'll talk a little bit about the, the difference in the recruitment process potentially for um, D1 schools, because it does differ from D1 to D2 to D3, um, but essentially, um, the recruitment process underlying is the same, um, but liberal arts colleges definitely allow students that have an interest in, in playing a sport to compete at any level, um, potentially varsity, but also club and intramural for sure. Um, some of our highlights um, as part of our conference, we compete in the West Coast Conference. So our rivals are Santa Clara University, Gonzaga, BYU, um, University of the Pacific, uh, University of San Diego, Loyola Marymount, Pepperdine, 
that's our consortium of schools. Um, and St. Mary's typically ranks among the top performing in the WCC every single year. Our men's and women's basketball team consecutively have actually competed in March Madness um, in the March Madness tournament six times out of the last 12 years, um, or sorry, eight times out of the last 14 years now. Um, and our uh, rugby team has taken the national championship title from Berkeley the last two years from Cal. Um, rowing notably for women is actually the only D1 sport that we offer that actually takes on walk-on players and even students with no experience that just have a interest in playing a D1 sport um, can actually try out and compete and then play competitively for our rowing team. Um, also distinctly, men's soccer has taken the WCC championship title the last three years in a row. So um, although we are a smaller school, St. Mary's is definitely a school that's really big in spirit, that has a huge emphasis on athletics, um, and students are really proud to be Gales. All right. Jake, was the slide um, of the D1, D3, did that come before this or is this after it? Um, it's after it. You want me to jump to it? Nope, that's okay. okay. Um, before we jump into each of our, our NCAA um, divisions, uh, just to share a couple fast facts and figures with you all, because the NCAA is so vast, um, you know, we have the, the separate categorizations of athletics, but just really to showcase, you know, the, the vastness of opportunities to play at the collegiate level. Um, there's over 1,000 NCAA athletic colleges in the United States with over 100 athletic conferences. Um, so for example, the Pac-12, the Big East, the ACC, um, the WCC, these are all conferences um, that exist nationally. Um, there's 40 affiliated organizations and uh, the NCAA serves over about a half a million student athletes across 19,500 teams competing in 90 championships, um, 24 total sports and in three total divisions. All right, so kicking it off with division one. So division one is considered the highest level of competition um, out of the NCAA divisions. Um, students are recruited at a high level and intense level from their freshman year to their senior year in high school, oftentimes committing to a college and signing to a college at the D1 level um, in the fall semester, usually about September of their senior year. Um, division one athletics are, um, provide or provide scholarships for opportunities that are specific by the athletic departments. So at D1 schools across the nation, athletic departments sponsor student athletes scholarships. So um, all of the athletic aid that's established or provided and offered to student athletes is at the discretion of the coaches and the athletic departments. Um, examples of other D1 schools, I'm sure um, you probably have a long list that you can name off the top of your head. St. Mary's, of course, um, Stanford University, Colgate, and UCLA, um, USC, just to name a few. Um, these are all considered D1 schools. Awesome. And I'll take Division II since I rep Division II institution. Certainly, there still is a high level of competition. So I want you to start thinking, okay, it's not just like well, D1 is just better than D2, is better than D3. It's a lot about fit. Um, typically for Division II, you'll see much more balanced approach to sports and academics. Obviously though, no matter what sport you play at whatever division, you're going to hear this time and time again, you are a student athlete. And so student is first, right? Your job, your responsibility is to graduate from a college, is to be educated. Um, but sometimes you'll see that there's a little bit more of a balance in Division II. Scholarships are still available, although sometimes you'll see, or more frequently, you'll see the athletic scholarship stacked with academic scholarship. So oftentimes a student will come in with both academic or merit-based money in addition to athletic money. Um, that's how it happens for the most part at Eckerd. Um, there are still some very coveted full tuition scholarships, um, particularly at more competitive sports. Um, our basketball program is one of those sports. We participate in the Sunshine State Conference. Um, and so that uh, includes a number of different colleges and universities within the state of Florida. Some other examples, Eckerd is one of those, Bentley, um, and UCSD, which I didn't realize until I saw this on the slide. So very interesting. Um, 
Funny enough, both Eckerd and UCSD are known as the Tritons. Hmm. I'll hand it over to Caitlin now. Caitlin, who I should mention, even though she's representing Denison, she lives in LA. And if you are a baseball fan out there, you might know that there's something going on between uh, the Tampa Bay Rays and the LA Dodgers. So we might have to do some sort of bet where like, uh, I have to get you a Cuban sandwich or something. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. We, we love athletics, which is why we're doing this presentation and we love our teams. So go Dodgers. Um, so I'll take <laughs> division three, uh, because I represent a division three institution. So division three is the largest, um, NCAA division, um, in the United States. It is still a high level of play. It's just not quite at the level of division one and division two, but just like Jake said, um, just because a team is division three doesn't mean that they can't compete with some division one and division two teams. There are definitely a number of teams at Denison that play um, that play teams in other divisions. So the big difference I would say um, is there are no athletic scholarships available at all at division three institutions. Now that doesn't mean that there isn't merit money available. As you can see on this slide, um, about 80% of Division three athletes receive merit aid of some kind at their institutions. Uh, also, most we offer need-based aid as well, but that scholarship money is not going to exist at Division three schools for athletics. The other thing is, you know, Jenna mentioned that at Division one, you're often being recruited very, very early in high school. Division three, the recruitment process tends to happen a little bit later. Um, junior and senior year. We're gonna talk about the timeline, but it is really important to remember that the timelines can definitely differ both because of in, um, the institution specifically, but also the division. Um, so Denison is a division three school, as you can see here, Claremont McKenna, or all of the Claremont colleges are division three. Amherst College um, and many, many others, as this slide says, we are the largest division. Um, also, the National Association of Independent Athletics, or the NAIA, is actually not an NCAA division. It's not associated with the NCAA, um, but we thought it was worth mentioning because this is kind of the other larger, although quite small, um, independent athletic league that you might encounter if you are um, a recruit or if you are looking to play in college. Um, so just some examples, as you can see here, Carroll College, Indiana Wesleyan, Soka University of America, those are some examples. Um, but for the rest of the presentation, I think it's important to just remember we're mostly really just talking about the NCAA, not the NAIA. So Jenna, I think this is off to you. Yeah, we also wanted to just definitely accentuate the value of considering playing a club sport or even an intramural sport in college um, for many student athletes that might be, you know, maybe deterred by a college, despite the fact that they're going to be recruited to play athletically for an NCAA division one, two or three school. Um, there are so many opportunities for students to still play a sport that they love um, or to try a new sport. Um, just, you know, in a way that's more open for all students to try out to participate um, and that still competes at high levels you know for St. Mary's and I know for many other schools um, certainly for Denison and Eckerd many club sports um, like Eckerd's rugby team for example the sailing team um, for St. Mary's our rugby team our soccer programs and club sports um, compete against other schools in the on the west coast um, and compete against their their club teams for smaller regional tournament championship titles um, um, and intramural sports are certainly a way where if you have an interest in playing, you're going to be able to play. Um, it's really incredible, I think, for each and every single one of our schools and the colleges that change lives, how supportive our institutions are of students starting their own clubs, of starting their own intramural opportunities. Um, for example, a student at St. Mary's last year started a rodeo club. Um, we've had a Quidditch club before. Ultimate Frisbee intramurals is really popular here. Um, so anything that you have an aspiration for, that you have a dedication in, and that you've really dedicated towards through athletics, um, at any of our schools, you absolutely be able to participate and bring those to your college campuses. Great. So um, while we are talking mostly about athletics here, it's really important to think about some other institutional considerations as a student athlete. So some of those are the size of the institution. Um, we are all small schools, but again, do you want a large school? That's going to rule some schools out. 
location, um, the academic culture of a school, as well as cost and financial aid. You don't know what kind of scholarship you're going to get all of the time. So you need, but I would never let cost um, or thought, the cost that you think it's going to be affect whether or not you apply to a school because you never know what kind of scholarship or financial aid you might receive after you are admitted to those institutions. Um, so those are kind of institutional considerations. There are also some athletic considerations, including athletic culture of the school. Do you want a big, huge spirit rah-rah school? Well, if that's the case, certainly some schools are going to be ruled out. Do you want to be able to go abroad as a student athlete? You need to talk to the coach um, about that because at some schools, that's not going to be as easy as some other schools. Um, do you care about the team's success? Is it a winning team or are they in a building um, time. So you really just need to think about other things besides just, I want to play softball in college. There are lots of other things you should be considering. Also, um, what do the athletic and the admission processes look like at the schools that I'm considering? Because, you know, I think a lot of the time students just think about athletics and you really need to understand that not just division wise, as we're going to talk about the timeline, but institution wise, there are lots of different athletic recruitment um, situations and processes. So some schools, you might be able to get some kind of early academic evaluation from the Office of Admission. Other schools, you are not going to get that. Same thing with scholarships. Um, and I think it's really important to highlight that you are not into a school until you get a letter from the Office of Admission, right? Um, an official letter with either the director or the dean, whoever that person is at the school, you really need to make sure that you understand what um, an admit means. So we're gonna talk more about kind of specific um, considerations considering our current pandemic situation a little bit later, but those are just some things to consider. Okay, next. Yeah, Caitlin, I would just add, I, I definitely appreciate you bringing up just the importance of fit in the college search process, specifically for student athletes. Um, I think for so many of us, you know, when we think of colleges um, at the NCAA level, you know, we think of these really big name and selective schools, even some Ivy League colleges. Um, and that's why we exist in the Colleges That Change Lives is to showcase that there are incredible opportunities in our, our hidden gem college campuses for opportunities to play sports and to do everything that you want to do in college still. I'm going to talk about the incredible benefits for students to choose a liberal arts college or university specifically as a student athlete. There are so many advantages um, for students to play a sport competitively, but to attend a smaller and liberal arts focused college. Number one, academics by far, as Jake said, you are a student athlete. You are a student first and then an athlete. Um, academics are the number one priority for student athletes. If you are not performing well in your classes, either the D1, D2, D3 level, you're not going to be getting playing time on the field. You know, there's uh, at the D1 level, if you are falling between a, a certain GPA, um, you know, you might be ineligible for athletic scholarship. Um, you might potentially be at risk of academic probation. Um, there's so many institutional resources that come into play for all students across our college campuses, but specifically for student athletes, um, maybe because we're smaller, but I think more so because we take a much more mentor approach, to, a much stronger approach to mentorship between every single person that you'll encounter on a college campus. Number one, your coach. Um, you know, your coach is not just going to be a coach on the playing field that's going to be supporting you through your growth as an athlete. Um, they're considered as your teacher, as your mentor, and as an educator too. You know, they're just in a different kind of classroom. Um, liberal arts colleges for student athletes definitely have a much stronger um, intent on individualized advising and individualized learning. So not only will professors, you know, know your role as a student athlete and be more accommodating and able to work with you in adjustment of maybe your schedules or the ability to take a final early because it'll interfere with your practice time or, you know, a championship game that you're going to be a part of in the coming weeks. Um, but you'll have those resources at your fingertips from the moment that you get to campus, from the moment that you graduate. And that ensures that our student athletes are graduating in four years. 
it's also easier to connect with the campus community and stay focused on academics. Um, students are student athletes, you're living and learning with your peers. You know, you're not just a glorified mascot or a glorified, um, you know, entity. Um, you're someone that really has that immersive experience within the community itself. Um, so it's really wonderful that when your successes, you know, when you achieve success in the field or on the court or, you know, on the water, your peers and your professors are going to be cheering you on and supporting you along the way too. And most notably, I think the number one benefit of attending a liberal arts college as a student athlete is that you will graduate in four years. Um, graduate uh, Graduation rates, excuse me, for student athletes are two to three times higher than the national average. Um, across the nation, the national average for men graduating in four years um, as student athletes is 53% and 70% for women. Um, I will share with you for each of us here today, um, St. Mary's, our graduation rate for men in four years is 81% for our student athletes and 100% for our female and women student athletes. Um, Eckerd's had a 95% average graduation rate in like at least the last six years on average. Um, and graduation rates for all D3 student athletes is 87%. Um, so with all of these emphasis on advising and mentorship and support um, that really allows student athletes to achieve success, not only on the field, but off the field. Great, thank you. I'm gonna um move over we're going to talk a little bit about timeline so someone did ask a question i know caitlin you responded to them i'm just going to make sure in case other people are curious um yes this session is going to be recorded or is being recorded now i should say we should have access to it i think within the next few days so if you're a parent and you're watching because your child is in school obviously um this will become available if you'd like to go back at any point and watch the beginning. If you missed the beginning, you certainly can do that. Um, and then, of course, I also, this is my plug to um, encourage you to ask questions. You know, I think um, we've got still a, a good number of slides to go through, but uh, obviously want to make sure that we're answering any questions that you may have, any burning questions. Um, so let's go into a little bit of the high school timeline, what it looks like if we were in person. This would be the time where I'd be asking you to raise your hand. How many seniors, how many juniors, how many sophomores, how many first years? I hope some of you wanted, or at least two, were raising your hand, um, even though we can't see you. So for those of you who are first year in high school students, um, and hopefully if you're beyond that, you've already taken care of this. So grade nine, here's your plan. You'll hear a lot of talk. If you have the slightest interest in becoming a student athlete in college, you will hear a lot of talk about the NCAA Eligibility Center. This is where you will register um, in order to be a recruited student athlete. And so in grade nine, you want to register for that profile page. Yes, lots of student athletes have their own profile pages. Um, they've got their own websites where they put stats and everything and they can share that with the coach. That's all well and good and certainly can be really, really helpful in your recruitment process. Um, but it's all moot unless you have a um, cert certification account with the NCAA Eligibility Center. So be sure you do that. Um, if you fall behind academically, now is the time to recover, right? So not just for um, athletic recruitment, but for college admission, everything starts at grade nine. So we have access, we're going to look at what your grades are um, at the beginning of your high school experience. And so we're going to look at the types of courses you take, the rigor, are you academic, are you challenging yourself appropriately, um, and what types of grades you're taking. So if you're in the middle of grade nine right now, I know it's a crazy time. Some of you might even be learning remotely, which is not quite your style. I really encourage you um, to focus, spend some time focusing on your academics. Athletics is a full-time position in college as well as high school. So oftentimes, you know, when we're reading applications um, and when it's an application of a student athlete, you may feel like you don't have as many extracurriculars. We understand when we're reviewing it that your commitment to a sport, whether it's your high school varsity sport or your travel team, you know, that takes a lot of time um, and probably a lot of miles on mom and dad's cars. And so we understand that it may not be a long, long list, of extracurriculars, but we want to see that commitment. And certainly we want to see the commitment to your academics. 
Um, as this last bullet says, your core course GPA starts in ninth grade. We're gonna talk a little bit more about core course GPA. Looks like we have a question. So collective perspective with recruitment, how engaged should the student be with the coach and how distant should the parent be with the coach? I think that's a great question. I'm gonna talk a little bit more at the 11th grade timeline about the engagement of a student and a coach, but I would say, and I'm gonna ask Caitlin and Jenna maybe to also chime in, um, the engagement should start with the student, right? Um, and the student should really be engaging now even more than before with the coach. But you do have to be aware there are some tricky rules that the NCAA has in terms of different periods where we call them blackout periods or dead periods where there can be no communication depending on what, what year in high school you are. Sometimes um, there will be times where the coach can't call you but they can answer the phone um and so for some parents they get really really frustrated because they're like my son or daughter's been trying to call the tactic coach and the coach won't call the back and you have to understand what the timeline is sometimes the coach just based on the rules of ncaa can't call you back if they happen to be in the office they can answer the phone other thoughts on that caitlin and jenna that you you may want to to add yeah, I would add that's that's very true. There's, um, you know, the period of time, the dead period, the blackout period, where um, just due to NCAA restrictions, the coaches cannot communicate or officially recruit students. Um, and there's also very fine lines between the recruitment process. So I, I definitely emphasize that, you know, this is the student's journey, but it's also a collective family decision ultimately where the student will attend. Um, if you have competing offers from multiple colleges, you know, at whatever level in the NCAA, it's going to be really important that it's also a collective potential family decision. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into family decisions, such as financial, geographic, um, but certainly, you know, the student identity or the student um, engagement should be priority um, since this will be your specific and unique identity in college. I will just say ditto to both of them, student, especially at the level um, of division three specifically, I would say. Um, I, I think coaches really wanna be hearing from students as do the officers uh, that work in the admission office. Um, we're happy to take questions from parents too, but student first. Thank you both. I'm gonna move on to grade 10. The one last thing that I just wanna want to mention is some sports happen really, really early. And so you might start getting excited as a first year student in high school because the coach from XYZ University is sending you a note saying that they're really interested. That is exciting, right? Being wanted, starting that admission process early is very exciting. But just keep in mind that your priority right now in high school is to do well in school, obviously to do well on the field or on the court or wherever it is that you're doing your thing. Um, but there's a lot of time between ninth grade and when you start college. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, is it too late in senior year to get involved in sports recruitment? No, it's not. And I'm gonna move then on. We'll talk a little bit more about how you can catch up and everything, but I'm gonna move on to grade 10, if that sounds good. Yep. So grade 10, honestly, not a, a lot of new information. Um, as you can see here, you're going to register for a profile page or a certification account with the Eligibility Center um, and just continue to be in contact with your counselor. If you fall behind, I would say, again, this is more at the higher division levels. Um, you can start reaching out to coaches if you want, but they may or may not answer you, as Jake said. Um, at Division three, they, they may, because um, there isn't that it's a little bit less strict in division three, some of those blackout periods. Um, but grade 10, I would say just, just keep going, keep on that upward trajectory and keep kind of thinking about what it is you really want out of your athletic um, experience in college. With that, I think we'll go back to grade 11. Okay, I think that's me. So grade 11, this is where the rubber meets the road. You will hear from so many people. If you're already in grade 11, you're already hearing it. So grade 11 is the most important year in um, the college admission process. And I can't say that it's not untrue. I think that's like a triple negative right there. Um, the reason being is for the admission process, this is the last full year that we have access to. 
and upgrades. And so you want to make sure that grade 11, you are firing on lots and lots of cylinders, that you are doing well, that you are, like I said before, challenging yourself appropriately, um, and that you are in contact, particularly, I would say, the second half of your junior year with your college counselor. You know, give your college counselor, if you're a junior right now, a little bit of time. They're writing recommendation letters. They're working with seniors. They're trying to get their applications in. Um, but by January, February, you'll want to start having conversations with your college counselor and letting them know um, what types of schools you're interested in, pretend, potentially what types of division um, athletics you might be interested in. You'll also want to take um, an SAT or ACT. Now we're gonna talk a little bit um, later on about um, test optional, um, especially with NCAA eligibility. But if you are taking the SAT or ACT, if you are applying to schools that require the test score, you'll want to make sure that the eligibility center receives those test scores. 9999 is the code. Um, and then you'll also want at the end of your junior year to ask your counselor to upload those transcripts to the eligibility um, center. Um, I'm going to move on to grade 12. Jenna. So junior year is actually the first year that by NCAA restrictions and guidelines that coaches can actually begin the communication process officially with prospective student athletes. Um, so uh, first and foremost, I would recommend for the schools that you are considering applying to, go to all of their websites and explore their athletic pages. Um, many athletic pages specific to schools will have either um, forms or recruitment uh, applications that prospective student athletes can submit. Um, you know, as we all know, coaches do actively recruit at the NCAA, NCAA Division One and Double Two, uh, Division Two, um, uh, globally and even and nationally too. But our coaches can't be everywhere at once. So just because they might not be traveling to your area specifically for an ID camp or a clinic program, doesn't mean that they're not open to establishing communications with prospective student athletes. So this is where I would jump in to answer um, Dylan's question as to if it's too late in your senior year to get involved with athletic recruitment. Absolutely not. Division three, as Caitlin has shared, um, is an ongoing process. And even at the D1 level at St. Mary's, our student athletes are recruited in their senior year, we have um, several athletic programs that ongoingly will recruit student athletes into their senior year. So even at the D1 level, it is still possible. This is just a timeline to advise you in the best possible way. Um, so don't let our timeline, you know, make you nervous or, or scare you off as to, you know, if I didn't do this in ninth grade or 10th grade, is it too late for me to play a sport in college? It's certainly not. Um, so first and foremost, as a senior, um, oh, Jake, can you go back to the previous slide? So you're gonna wanna make sure that you are completing your final NCAA core classes. So every single student will have to complete their core A through G requirement courses in order to be eligible for admissions, um, not only to compete at the student athlete level, but also for college admissions. Um, you can find uh, the core courses required by the NCAA online on their website. Um, all students will have to complete you know, four years of English, um, at least three years of a math, um, three years of a natural science, at least two or three years of a social sciences and then additional maybe foreign language courses. You can find that all on the website. Um, it is recommended that you take the SAT or ACT multiple times, um, but to preface this, we can share with you that as far as we're aware um, and that we've been in communication with our um, compliance coordinators and our coaching staff, um, and as been communicated by the NCAA itself, uh, the governing body, the NCAA is waiving the SAT and ACT requirement for student athletes that are applying for the fall of 2021. So at least for this year, um, for prospective student athletes, it will not be required to have taken the SAT or ACT. Um, so certainly, you know, hopefully this, this gives you a little bit of relief. I know this has been a great barrier for many seniors this year and potential juniors even. Um, if you do have the ability currently or in the coming months to take the SAT or ACT that doesn't involve you traveling to a different state or um, you know, flying cross country even, um, 
consider taking the SAT or ACT. Uh, many schools will super score. So when it comes down to it, um, you know, should the NCAA resume the requirements of the SAT or ACT for the fall of 2022, um, graduating students, um, you'll already be prepared and you'll have the fundamentals. All right, next slide, please. And then lastly, after you graduate high school, it's important for the school that you've committed to to receive your final high school transcript. And the NCAA will also require this um, to ensure successful completion of all high school core academic classes. Um, and also just another brief reminder that these timelines are really specific to D1 and D2 schools. Um, again, there really is much more flexibility in the timeline with D3 schools. Awesome. Thanks so much. So um, a few questions Oops, coming up. I just want to make sure, Caitlin, do you want to just kind of um, help Mitch out about D3? Yeah. I don't know if you have track cross country, but he's asking about, yeah. um, you know, do you contact, if you're looking at a track cross country program at D3, do you contact the coaches directly? And I guess this is in a similar vein. Kyler wants to know, how do you get a coach to see you? Um, so maybe you can also talk about most schools have like a prospective student athlete form, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, at Division three schools, what I would say generally is um, contacting the coach is a good idea. The, the, the first response that a coach might give you is, yeah, I would love to talk to you. Please fill out my recruit form. So for example, at Denison, if you were interested in running cross country, I would Google cross country Denison, and there's going to be on the web page um, something that says like recruit me or recruit survey that's going to be very similar at a lot of schools that's really step one I would say then reaching out to the coach after that um, is a great step uh, the, in the direct yeah coaches directly are great if you're not sure who that coach is you can always reach out to the admission officer at those schools and they can help put you in contact with them um, and then to the question about how to get a coach to see you, at least at the division three level, I would say contacting them. Communication with them is really important. Um, traditionally, right, they might be at a tournament that you're playing in right now. A lot of our coaches at Denison are requesting um, tape, right? Um, so I would say that contacting a coach is the way to go. Um, and then there was one more question, Jake, that I'm just gonna hit quickly because it kind of is similar. Um, there were no track meets, for example, in junior year. So what kind of stats can you use to show your ability? I think this goes beyond track and field. I think this is really applicable to most sports at this point, especially in the spring. Um, in terms of specific stats, that's going to obviously depend on the sport or the event that you run. But I think being in contact with the coaches, um, they're going to ask you specifically for some things. They're going to ask you for your time. They're going to ask you for specific tape if you have that. So again, the answer I would say is be in contact with the coaches, especially at the D3 level. Thanks so much. Yeah, and I would agree. I, I Before doing this presentation, I said to our athletic director at Eckerd, is there anything you want me to share with folks? And I amused myself that he said, um, the most important thing um, is even though NCAA recruitment calendar is back to normal, um, a lot of institutions may have um, their own institutional policy on if coaches can travel, if coaches can go and visit, if student athletes can even come onto the campus. So now more than ever, you want to be in constant communication. You know, don't barrage them with emails and emails and emails, but you want to make sure that you two are connecting and communicating because it's just, you know, the pandemic, like everything else, has upended um, student athlete um, or prospective student athlete recruitment. This, we've got like two minutes left, and I think your questions are great. I'd love to spend even more time in answering your questions. This is just a chart. There's this version, which has been up for a little bit, um, that talks about what qualifies you. So Jenna was talking about those core courses. 10, seven indicates you have to complete 10 of the required 16 courses by your senior year. Your senior year in NCAA world is also known as your seventh semester. I don't know why they can't just say senior year, but sometimes they go on like first semester, second semester. Seven of those courses must also be in English, math, the natural or physical sciences. So make sure that those core courses um, are being filled with some of those even really 
core English, math, natural, or physical. This is just a very similar chart. Um, sometimes it's easier to see it in check boxes than in um, words, but similarly, this kind of tells you between division one and division two, what is a qualifier and early academic qualifier. You definitely wanna be sort of right up here. And then this also means that because if you hit these thresholds, you do not have to submit test scores. So this is also talking about what we're doing, what the NCAA is doing, um, since a lot of students don't have the ability to um, take their SAT or ACT. Finally, here are some resources. I know we're getting to the end of time. Um, you're welcome, Rita. And I'll, we'll wait for any other questions. But there's some resources, some websites for you, and our contact information. Any final thoughts, Jenna or Caitlin? No, yep. thank you for coming and be in touch if you have any questions. Sorry, Jenna. No, no, I was just going to say the same thing. Thank you so much, everybody. And definitely feel free to contact us. I know now more than ever, it's so important to stay engaged with colleges. So if we can provide you to different resources athletically, or just if any questions come up about our general colleges and admissions, um, you know where to find us. Yep. We're really uh, hopeful to get sports back on our campuses um, for the most part. And go race, right? <laughs> go Dodgers. Go Dodgers. <laughs> Thank you to all of our panelists and students who have attended today's session. As you exit out this session, you will be presented with a four question survey. Your feedback will allow us to improve our programming. Um, and as noted earlier, the panelists were correct that this session was recorded. So it will be available on our website um, next week. And um, lastly, thank you all again and have a lovely day. <laughs>